Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16th to 20th. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma. And it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Robert Wright, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands-on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers include William Barber II, Anna Carter Florence, Lauren Winner, Emily and Amelia Nagoski, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the third Sunday after the Epiphany, which falls on January 23rd, 2022, are from Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, 5 through 6, and 8 through 10, Psalm 19. We continue in our reading of 1 Corinthians, a latter part of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 12 through 31a, and then the gospel, chapter 4 of Luke 14 through 21. I'm kind of sad that Joy J. Moore is taking a couple of weeks off, but I'm also kind of happy that we get to talk more about Luke 4, 14 through 21. We don't have to share the microphone as much. Because mm, you like this passage. I, I do. I struggle with this passage and, and like it all at the same time. It's a fun way to launch a public ministry, you know? Well, I think uh, your sentiments are shared with the audience. Uh, of course, the audience response we will get next week. And that's the, that's the gospel lesson for next week. Just how is it that people uh, respond to Jesus' ministry, ministry? But as you said, Matt, this is Jesus' first words, really. Well, except when he's 12, but that doesn't really count. But this is his inaugural event of his ministry in Luke. And, uh, and then we want to ask, uh, that's one of the questions, though. How, how do people respond? And, and what kind of ministry is he inaugurating? I think that's really a, a key question here. Uh, Joel Green talks about in, his, in some of his notes on this passage that what kind of ministry will result when you have the Spirit's anointing and the baptism and you have demonstrated obedience to God in the wilderness. So those two events, of course, have happened in uh, Jesus' life so far, our Jesus' uh, uh, grown-up life, if you will, the baptism and the temptation in the wilderness. And then now what does this ministry, what does that, what does that ministry mean? What is that going to, uh, what is the result of that reality? And I think that's a, a significant question to ask uh, how, how Jesus presents what this ministry is going to be about is the direct result of being anointed by the spirit and having the presence of the spirit and the way in which he has already embodied a kind of obedience to God. So what does being, having the presence of the spirit, of the spirit and being obedient to God look like? What is that? I think that's a helpful way to frame, if you will, this sermon of Jesus. Yeah, I think I, I agree with all that. I think I would add one thing, which is also how will scripture play itself out or how will scripture kind of resolve itself. We've had so many scriptural texts uh, alluded to in the canticles, in the songs in Luke 1 through 2, uh, in, in John's preaching, but also then uh, with the, the, the testing in the wilderness. And so now you've got scripture again, this time quoted, and two texts combined in a kind of creative linking of a particular word. But then the pronouncement of Jesus is this text is now fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, it's not so much a kind of exegetical puzzle to put together based on what you've heard so far or these various collations of biblical texts. It's going to be embodied in him and in his ministry. The nice part about that is you get a very short sermon. He just basically says, here it is, uh, and here I am as a result. 
course, at the end of Luke, you're going to get the promise of the Spirit poured out on Jesus' followers, but you're also going to get statements about Scripture being fulfilled in the whole of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, also, in ways that aren't really parsed out. Well, will this happen to fulfill that text? But in ways that, again, point you back to who Jesus is and what he does and who benefits. Yeah, I think, too, that the that what difference is it going to make, as you said, Matt, with regard to how this gets embodied in Jesus' ministry? And one of the key aspects of Jesus' ministry is this being filled with the power of the Spirit. And uh, what is what is the Spirit's power going to look like? How is it going to be made manifest? How are we going to tell that it uh, that it's present and doing what it intends to do? And so you get some really key things in this sermon of Jesus that that I think function as kind of benchmarks then going forward or what is it how is it what, how is it that Jesus ministry is 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 distinctive and you have here's a sermon where the spirit's power is made manifest or Jesus ministry is oriented to the marginalized uh, we have second that it's it's not tied to a particular geographical or social location, Joel Green says, and then and and that it attracts or demands even response. And so I think for the preacher to think about those things, I found really helpful this time, particularly as we continue through Luke through, you know, through this this year C, is how are we listening for those features of Jesus' ministry of, of oriented to the marginalized can't it's not not jesus ministry that embodiment of the spirit is not going to be isolated to a certain place or people or situation and that and that there's a there's going to be a call for response and what will that response be you can't really sit back and say oh that's really interesting hmm. and yeah there something you're gonna you're gonna have a response to this and what is it going to be which will happen next week, and which will happen the week after that in Luke 5 when he's uh, in the boat with Peter. I, but I, I do think there's a way in which there's, if not an exclusion, that there's at least a way of expansion going on here that it's, it's worth noting who's left out. Um, like, I don't hear myself addressed in this text, in these Isaiah passages, unless I do some exegetical gymnastics to get there. All right, good news to the poor. Uh, I'm not poor. Uh, neither are either one of you. We can talk about ways in which we might have poverty of other things, you know, but materially we're, we're not. Well, and how uh, I don't, or, yeah, well, how Luke defines that is key too. Go ahead. Anyway. Right. I don't experience myself as somebody who's, who's captive. You can talk about captivity to sin and other problems. Absolutely. But in general, recovery of sight to the blind, uh, suffering oppression and going free. I mean, th there are some specifics here that he is proclaiming good news for and, and to, and of course, a lot of Christian liturgy, a lot of our language has expanded that, you know, was blind, but now I see. And all that stuff is true at one level. But but first and foremost, he's announcing good news to people who are not, at least like me, I'll speak for myself. Which doesn't mean I'm excluded or I'm somehow cast out or judged in this. But I need to sit back and let this ministry start to um, start to unfurl, right? Start to do its thing and see for who it's going to benefit first and foremost. Uh, and that'll be a tension throughout the gospel. It'll be a tension with some of his interactions with Pharisees and others who are interested in him, but don't find themselves being congratulated by him, perhaps to the degree that they want uh, to hear that. It will keep going back to the things like, why does he spend all of his time with tax collectors and sinners? He's a drunkard. He's a glutton, right? He's with the wrong crowd. And here he announces, this is, this is where I'm going. Um, doesn't say you can't follow me there, but this is who it's for first and foremost. Well, and to what extent that's going to be, we'll talk about that next week, but that that's part of the rejection right. Right. is that, the, you know, the rejection is the assumption that Jesus is for them. Right. <laughs> and, so a preacher has to expand that. Say, this is good news for you if you're here and you're, you're rich and successful and comfortable. But, but first and foremost, you have to hear the text, I think, in all of its, I don't even know if I want to say offense, but you know what I mean, in terms of its, its, its really clear direction. Let me say yeah. one more thing too about this. Uh, I love the line in verse 29. You know, it's, there's so much drama in such a sparsely narrated scene where, you know, he stands up to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. 
he unrolled the scroll and you can see this happening in real time in time and the setup takes longer than the actual reading in the sermon itself he reads it you know rolls it back up give it back to the attendant sat down the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him which is this great pause and just a reminder luke loves language i think all new testament authors do but loves language of vision to talk about faith and recognition of who jesus is uh, there's some problematic aspects of that if we take that too far and how we think about blindness and sight say this is somebody whose prescription gets worse every time he goes to the optometrist, but um, but to note that, that part of what they're doing here is they're sizing him up. They're stunned in this moment, but the, the open question I think is, will they see him for who, for who he really is? Will they see his messianic mission for what it really is? Or will they desire something else uh, and go a different way? In some ways that sets up next week, but it also helps to kind of I guess, condition people to look for some of these verbs or these references to sight that we're going to encounter. Other things you want yeah, to say? Uh, you know, the one thing I would say is uh, leaning into next week and, and uh, taking the Isaiah passage in its context, probably the Isaiah passage in its context, uh, which could be translated, the spirit of the Lord is within me, uh, and he has anointed me. The word anointed, I think, in the in the New Testament context, has a Christological dimension. Not so in the Old Testament, uh, a messianic, so meant by Christological. Um, but there, the prophet is preaching within Israel. So uh, you know, Israel having been just um, oppressed and and taken captive by Babylon, and set set free. So that's that context, but now Jesus is expanding this beyond the borders of Israel. And that's what you lean into next week, uh, which is then gonna be part of the reason, like you said, they're sizing up and they don't really like it. Yeah, I think the only other thing I would mention too about this passage is how, how the preacher can connect some of what Jesus is saying theologically what he's what he's starting to recognize and, and communicate about his own ministry. And I've said this before, uh, how you can draw a line back to the confessions of Mary, uh, Mary's song, and then also Elizabeth's or, oracle of that, that recognition of, uh, of both Elizabeth and Mary, realizing that this is, this is the spirit of the Lord at work for them. And how is it that Jesus is carrying that forward? Uh, that Jesus, uh, that Jesus experienced that in his own life uh, with uh, with his mother and with his um, with his cousin, and uh, and how is it that that that's something that he is carrying forward? And so I think making those connections back to, uh, as you said earlier, Matt, those earlier chapters of Luke. Are, I, I think it's real, really important. You know, Jesus is not just making stuff up. Oh, this sounds good. And I'll quote Isaiah, uh, but the way in which he's interpreting Isaiah into this time and place, an act of interpretation based on how he is seeing uh, his own ministry unfolding and his own calling and the way in which that's something that, uh, that, that Mary did. Mary connected the dots uh, in the Magnificat of her experience back to, uh, to what she's known God to do and, and the characteristics of God. And so how Jesus is doing the same thing here, that reinterpretation of scripture in this, in this time and place that is, that is a correlate or connected to the characteristics of God that he, uh, that he has experienced in his own life and in the life of his, um, and of his mother. I would only add also perhaps Leviticus 25, but I'll leave it to people to read commentaries uh, on our website to talk a little bit more about that, how there's a connection perhaps from the Isaiah reference on a phasis or release in the Septuagint to the idea of the Jubilee as a year of release as well. Yes. Awesome. Is this the one time of year where people get to talk about Nehemiah? I was wondering that myself. I didn't one time it up, three years. But, uh... Maybe this is the one time every three years they get to talk about Nehemiah. <laughs> I love how the lectionary skips two verses and it's because it, they have a lot of names in them. <laughs> I was thinking that, I was wondering why uh, I, I also looked that up. I think you ought to uh, add the verses to make the lector read all those names. 
depends on who volunteers to be the lector, I think, and you can. But there is. But um, before they go on, just say, hey, if you don't mind, can you just add these two verses? Just, that'd be great, thanks. And then just, you know, <laughs> hide in the sacristy. One thing that's important at the end of verse seven uh, that's left out um, is, the, uh, is the phrase that so then all these names uh, who are Levites helped the people to understand the Torah while the people remained in their places. I think that, I mean, I think the sort of uh, similar to Luke, uh, the passage is important to Bible scholars for a different reason than it might be important um, in a worship service in this context. Uh, you know, for Bible scholars, a lot of us think this is this shows the coming together of the full Torah. Post, post exile, they've edited together the northern and southern traditions that they had in exile, and now you've got the whole Torah, and the community is reconstituted around the word of God. I think that's the, I mean, that's the key message for today. What does it mean? To, to be reconstituted as a nation, as a community, well, it is to be centered around the word of God. Ezra puts that in its place, but also then it has to be interpreted. People have to, ha uh, people need help uh, understanding. And so, I mean, that then kind of leans into what Jesus does. So that verse eight, they read from the book, from the, from the Torah of God with interpretation, they gave the sense. Um, the Bible needs interpretation. It, uh, it's such a foreign now uh, cross-cultural experience to read the Bible and people need help understanding it. The thought of sitting there for about four, maybe five hours and listening to somebody read Torah and people and, you know, translating and interpreting it sounds brutal uh, to me and to a lot of people. But I think what you're talking about, Rolf, is important to lift up that this is this isn't a ritual that's just kind of assigned to this is what we do when the walls get rebuilt. There's a kind of rediscovery here of who they are. There's a kind of rediscovery of who God is that that's taking place here. And, you know, most people's view of Torah is so negative and so distorted and sometimes for good reason, <laughs> but sometimes for really bad reason. And so to help people get a sense for what's going on here, that that uh, how to make sense of the tears and the joy. Corey Driver tries his hand at this. I'm not sure I totally would follow him there, but he does highlight the ways in which the Bible has been used to do great harm. And that certainly uh, demands our attention. But to make sense of the response of the, of, the, of, the, of the anguish and then the response of the leaders, now we're gonna celebrate today. And to help people get a sense for maybe not each individual law of Torah, but the overall view of God in Torah should be something that sends you toward rejoicing, should be something that opens you up now to your neighbor, whether it's your neighbor close by, like other residents of Jerusalem in this case, or even more broadly. And so I just don't think you can preach on that enough to kind of help imprint that on people's minds. That there's a sense of joy here in a God who wants the things that promote life and human flourishing. That was a long way to say something really simple, but not as long as it took to read the Torah that morning. Yeah, especially if you read the whole thing, which I don't, I don't even know if you could do in a day, but uh, out loud. But it's also it the that, message version. The Sorry. Reader's Digest condensed version that came out like 1983. The, uh, it's also a festival day. Um, Corey Driver associates it with Rosh Hashanah, uh, but if you keep on going to the, uh, the verses, they have this feast. And if you keep reading further in uh, Nehemiah 8, uh, it's the festival of booths. And so that, I mean, I, I can see three things happening here um, as the people are reconst reconstituted, I'll say that. One, the word of God is central. Uh, the, second of all, it's a feast. Note, I love, I love feasts. So this is, you know, uh, very similar to our major feasts in the Christian church. That is literally a feast. Go away and eat the best food, drink the best wine, but make sure you uh, give to those for whom nothing is prepared. But then it's also this big religious uh, festival and ceremony. So there you go. Got your three-point sermon right there. There you go. Well, I, I think just to summarize, too, that it's... Uh, what we see in 
actually in both the Luke text and the Nehemiah text is this the centrality of God's word, the centrality of, of the way in which moments, uh, critical moments demand interpretation of scripture or they call for a reinterpretation of scripture, not for the, not for the sake of, of ritual necessarily, but for the sake of how is God present in this moment? Uh, and and the way in which the way in which scripture is cast as that kind of resource, if you will, for the people of God. I think it could be another way that the preacher could think about this, help people think about think about that in these passages. Psalm nineteen. It's just a great psalm. It's it is. Such, it's, it's lovely. Such fan, it's such fantastic poetry. I think it was C.S. Lewis who called it one of the great lyrics uh, in history, uh, or at least one of the great lyrics of the Bible, lyrical poems. This, I love how it starts off with this um, mystical sense that creation uh, bears witness to God in language that human beings can't understand. You know, it says there is no speech, nor are there words, yet their, uh, their voice is not heard, and yet their voice goes out to the end of the earth, and so on. That. Um, somehow uh, creation bears a witness to its creator. And theologically, what's important there is that in the first verses, the name for God is El, the generic name for the divine. Um, and, but then when it switches to the focus on Torah, which is, I assume, why this is here as the response to the first um, reading. So it gets incredibly uh, I would say very lockstep in the way the poetry comes. You get these synonyms for Torah, the law of the Lord, the decrees of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, precepts. the commandment of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. And then you get an adjective is perfect, sure, right, clear. And then you get a um, participle uh, with an adjective or with an object, reviving the soul, making wise the simple and so on. And now it's about Yahweh. So it's the Torah of Yahweh. So now you get the particular name of the Lord revealed to Israel. So that move from the generic and nature to the revealed. And, uh, and then in the end to confession and forgiveness uh, where the Psalm writer uh, acknowledges his own sinfulness uh, and uh, seeks um, to be made blameless. It's just a great song, great poem. Do yourself a favor, Jess Ray has a modern version of this uh, that she sings and it's uh, find it on YouTube. It's fantastic. Well, it's such an interesting contrast to our juxtaposition of the, the heavens are telling the glory of God and then, and then with the, with the law, with the words, right? So it's this just, and you, you get sort of the, the all encompassing reality of God in this Psalm uh, that I think is, I think it's just really beautiful. Okay, and we have we are continuing on in our reading of our last reading of the last portion of the letter of Paul's letter to the uh, Corinthians, first letter to the Corinthians, and a very very familiar portion I think of scripture for a lot of people. The image of the or the body metaphor that we get in Paul. The, uh, I mean, I think to help people get into this so that they don't start, I mean, so many people know the body metaphor and it's kind of always been, we all belong here and everybody's got a gift to share, find out what your gift is and, and come and share it. We'll appreciate it, which is all good. Uh, it's a little too instrumental or pragmatic for me if, if that's the, the main message, to be honest, uh, because all of this, I think, proceeds out of verse 13, this notion of from one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, uh, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. It's reminiscent of Galatians 3.28, one of the reasons we think it might have been part of a baptismal formula. But it's that kind of, of radical unity here that the, the spirit itself is one because the spirit is, is something that makes people one, right? It brings together these diverse, these separate kinds of people into a unity in Christ that's not about sameness, it's about there being no longer any kind of stratification or kind of hierarchy or level of value. 
in God's eyes. And so just to focus on that uh, for a while, to talk about that radical sense of unity that is there, uh, and also a unity that's not about assimilation, it's not about sameness, but really is one that appreciates difference, that finds in diversity of folks and diversity of gifts a real, um, well, a real body, to be honest, but a body that allows everybody to participate as who they are. Yeah, and I think not only participation, but uh, but a reliance on uh, that that part of part of the capacity. If you if you go the direction of the you know the way in which all are are invited into into this body that is uh, made one with the spirit and you know how sometimes you're right like it that this is you know every gift is everybody's special every gift is special which is all good but there is a the body metaphor there's just this I, I I'm not sure how I I don't think I can adequately describe uh, and maybe that's the point right that's the point in terms of what this image how it works on you is that there's this absolute interconnectedness that uh that it and you and if you just stop and thinking about that like physically physiologically with your body like if one part is not 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 well how the other part isn't and how like you know these weird things like you know you can have a toothache and it like affects all of your body i mean it, it's just the, it's just the way in which that that extraordinary interconnectedness of the entirety. That's where I would want preachers to sit a little bit in that, in that space of, of recognizing that. And, and that there's, uh, there's contribution, but there's also reliance on and, uh, and dependence on. And how, how is it that, that those two aspects or those, those those ways of being are important as well. It's not just what you're contributing, but how you are relying on the other uh, in, in, in this metaphor that, that Paul uses to imagine what the body of Christ or what the church looks like. 